Psychedelic drugs are a bundle of contradictions. In the early period of exploration, they were largely unregulated, and they were both praised and sought after for the unique experiences described by their users and condemned and criminalized out of fear for their unpredictable effects, which brought about a period of stringent regulation. Some of these contradictory ideas and the folk tales, opinions, legends, and myths that supported them are still very much with us. After a prolonged period of neglect, psychedelics are once again the topic of mainstream societal interest, and psychedelic-assisted therapy is re-emerging. But decades of misinformation and disinformation about these substances pre present a formidable body of mythology and propaganda, which needs to be considered if we're not to carry forward the errors and misconceptions of the past. The use of psychoactive plants was once a common practice in Europe. The Eleusinian mysteries, for example, were transformative rituals that took place in ancient Greece. For over two millennia, this experience, which many claim to have been a psychedelic session, was not only tolerated by ancient civilizations, but celebrated by it. During the European witch craze, the full force of the Inquisition was brought to bear on cunning men and witch women, the users of psychoactive plants. By casting the healer as a witch and the plants as tools of Satan, the European vestiges of these elements of pagan and shamanic consciousness were driven underground. The word psychedelic, which is derived from Greek roots, meaning manifesting the mind, was first used by Humphrey Osmond in a letter to Aldous Huxley in 1956. And within a few years after it was coined by Huxley and Osmond, the word psychedelic had become identified with illegible posters, gaudy, unreadable tabloids, crowded, noisy parties, and anything paisley. <laughs> US researchers in the 1950s had also begun to explore the possibility that LSD might be used to enhance creativity or to facilitate the psychotherapy. The therapeutic potential of the psychedelic drugs became the subject of speculation, study, and controversy on a wide scale. In 1960, Sidney Cohen conducted a survey of researchers who had administered psychedelics to almost 5,000 individuals on more than 25,000 occasions, and he concluded that untoward effects were infrequent and that the psychedelics were, quote, safe when given to a selected healthy group if used with proper precautions. Hoffman's reports of his self-experiments and Arthur Stoll's original systematic description of LSD-induced mental states in healthy volunteers and in schizophrenic patients were followed by more than 1,000 reports of therapeutic experimentation with LSD and related substances, which encompassed some 40,000 patients. In October of 1961, the Harvard Psilocybin Research Project, run by Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, was criticized by its sponsor, the Center for Research in Personality, for failure to adhere to guidelines similar to those that had been described by Cohen. Soon afterward, Timothy Leary left Harvard without notice, and in May 1963, Richard Alpert became the only Harvard faculty member to be fired in the 20th century. National Institute of Mental Health psychopharmacologist Jonathan Cole expressed very mixed feelings about research with psychedelics, particularly the possibility that they might be used to, quote, establish long-term control over minds by altering loyalties or changing moral attitudes or political beliefs. In, in fact, for 20 years, starting in the 1950s, the United States Central Intelligence Agency and the United States Department of Defense conducted secret research, including Project MKUltra, using various psychedelic drugs such as LSD and mescaline in an attempt to develop a practical brainwashing technique. Maimon Cohen, a geneticist from SUNY Buffalo, became interested in the possible deleterious effects of LSD during a short visit to the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco <laughs> while attending a medical meeting in 1966. Horrified by what he saw there, he determined that he would discover a medical reason compelling enough to stop young people from trying LSD. Cohen's findings of in vitro chromosome damage were immediately extrapolated to a potential for teratogenic effects in vivo and quickly and widely reported in the popular press. Sensational accounts of LSD experiences of celebrities, the influence of LSD on creativity, and the superiority of LSD treatment to conventional psychotherapy spurred popular demand. Television and newspaper coverage began to depict LSD as a new wonder drug. Cosmopolitan reported that, quote, suddenly LSD has become the sophisticated fun thing to try around the smart set, the fast set, and the beat set. And if you haven't got a buddy who can run down to the, fav the friendly neighborhood LSD bootlegger and buy an ampoule of those little blue pills, you were simply not in, my friend. During this period, widespread concerns were also voiced about the impact of drug experiences on the productivity and stability of young people who were influenced by psychedelics. 
A psychedelic syndrome of dissocial, unproductive, and alienated behavior was believed to afflict those who came in contact with psychedelic drugs. Behavior cited as evidence of this problem included rejection of Judeo-Christian roots for Eastern spirituality, <laughs> political pacifism, an adoption of patterns of magical and cosmic thinking, sexual license, and a preference for bizarre dress and inadequate personal hygiene. <laughs> By March 1964, an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association described the use and misuse of psychedelics as among the touchiest subjects of the recent months. For the sake of the biological fitness of the next generation, the time had come to stress the negative attitudes of psychotomimetic drugs. A Saturday Evening Post feature story, The Hidden Evils of LSD, claimed that new research had found that LSD was, quote, causing genetic damage that poses a threat of havoc now and appalling abnormalities for generations yet unborn, and that if you take LSD even once, your children may be born malformed or retarded. Battle lines were being drawn. In an era of racial tension, urban riots, and growing divisiveness about the war in Southeast Asia, President Lyndon Johnson attacked LSD in his 68 State of the Union message, and gubernatorial candidate Ronald Reagan vied in California for the toughest anti-LSD position. On October 4, 1969, Diane Linkletter, the youngest daughter of radio and television personality Art Linkletter, died after jumping from her sixth floor apartment. Her father held a press conference the day after her death in which he claimed that rather than being a suicide, Diane was, quote, murdered by the people who manufacture and sell LSD. No drugs were found in Diane Linkletter's system by toxicology studies. A personal friend of then-President Richard Nixon, Linkletter was invited to Washington two weeks after his daughter's death to brainstorm about new anti-drug legislation. It was an ideal vehicle for generating support for a bill that Nixon was planning on sending to Congress, the, quote, war on drugs. By 1966, LSD had been outlawed in California. Shortly after that, the remaining states and many countries followed suit. In the United States Senate Subcommittee on Executive Reorganization, chaired by Robert Kennedy, every medical doctor and every LSD researcher who testified discouraged making simple possession of LSD a crime. The potential of psychedelics to cause direct physical harm was often exaggerated and in some instances fabricated. The Los Angeles Times published the first report of permanent impairment of vision as the result of staring at the sun while under the influence of LSD. The Associated Press circulated this story nationally and it appeared in Time Magazine and in the New York Times. Forbidden fruit, however, tends to be picked without oversight. In a famous experiment, the details of which are still being debated, Tusco, a 7,000-pound male Indian elephant, was claimed to have, quote, died from an overdose of LSD. The experimenters calculated in their report that the dose given may have been orders of magnitude too high, 100 micrograms per kilogram versus the 1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram that's considered to be an effective dose for humans. Using this model, the calculated dose for a 3,000-kilogram elephant would have been about 6 to 9 milligrams rather than the 297 milligrams that was actually administered. Debate about whether LSD was the cause of Tesco's death continues almost 60 years later. Research in animal models has continued to support the consensus that LSD is not teratogenic nor oncogenic, and that it is, at most, a weak mutagen. Two extensive reviews of the literature published in the early 1970s attempted to synthesize the numerous conflicting findings of various studies, and both concluded that, quote, Pure LSD ingest, ingested in moderate doses does not damage chromosomes in vivo, does not cause detectable genetic damage, and is not a teratogen nor a carcinogen in man. According to Catherine Bonson of the Controlled Substance Staff of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research of the FDA, quote, today there are no credible data supporting the allegation that LSD alters genetic material. But today, after a 50-year hiatus, research on the therapeutic potential of the psychedelic drugs is gradually being resumed. The position of the psychedelic drugs in Schedule I was developed during a time of fear, political concern, and misinformation about psychedelic substances that led to establishing substantial barriers impeding their research and potential clinical use. Renewed interest in the use of psychedelic drugs has led to robust results in controlled studies in association with psychotherapy, some psychedelic drugs have shown good effects with adequate safety. It's time to reconsider their status as Schedule I drugs. Thank you.